All right, this weekend we are going to continue in our series, Knowing God by Name. And as you've seen around the room, we've looked at a variety of names of God, whether it's uh, the name God itself, Elohim in Hebrew, or Yahweh, which is the personal name of God revealed in Exodus chapter 3 and then used again throughout Scripture. Uh, Names like uh, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sebeoth, or El Elyon, God Most High, or El Shaddai, God who is Almighty. Our, Our hope and our purpose in this was be to expose you to just some of the names of God that are revealed in Scripture. So that as you journey through life and grow in your faith, you can appreciate the character of God that's revealed through each of them and also the promise that comes with it, uh, that God Most High, for example, is on our side. There is no greater God, or El Shaddai, the God who is powerful, fights on our behalf. Today, we're going to take a look at one of the names that you probably already know well, especially from the Christmas story, the name Emmanuel. Here you can see two uh, screenshots of where it shows... Oop, that's my kids probably from home saying they are watching it right now. That's Debbie. There you go. <laughs> uh, my son says, we are not on other screens, you silly person. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, so my Apple Watch was lighting up. There we go. So uh, it shows up in three occasions in Scripture, uh, twice in the book of Isaiah, and then again in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, by the way, if you're curious why sometimes it's spelled E-M-M-A-N-U-L, that's because of the Greek, and you can kind of see it there, the capital E. Uh, in Hebrew, it's translated with an I from the preposition with us, Emmanuel. And we're going to see this show up a couple times as we go through our time in the Word today. So although it's only used two or three times in scriptures, it's a familiar name because of its uh, participation in the Christmas story. So let's start right there in Matthew chapter 1. We have just heard, and Joyce, you did a great job, I think it was reading earlier today, uh, the story of Jesus, how he was uh, born of the Virgin Mary, who was not yet married, although she was legally bound to Joseph, her husband-to-be. And although there were a number of times where there are miraculous births in Scripture, uh, women who were not able to have kids, they were either old or they were barren, but God broke through to bring uh, children into the world. In this case, it was something that was humanly impossible, for she had never been married, had never known a man, she was a virgin. But, but in Jesus, what we see is a promise given first in Isaiah, finally fulfilled. And so Matthew uh, makes that connection for us by quoting that verse. Here we see it in verse 23. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, She'll give birth to a son, and they will call him this name of God, Emmanuel, God with us. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter 7, and we're going to take a look at how this name first shows up. We're going to do a little study first about the context and the situation and the characters who are involved. So I kind of nerded out a little bit on this one, so just bear with me. I thought it was interesting. Hopefully you do a little bit as well. We're going to start in verse 1. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, and grandson of Uzziah, those are the two kings prior to him uh, in the line of kings of Judah, and King Rezin of Syria and Pekah, son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, set out to attack Jerusalem. However, they were unable to carry out their plan. So uh, you may not know all that much about Ahaz as a king, uh, but he's actually one of the kings of Judah and Israel that is extremely well attested in the archaeological record. So for example, this right here is a clay impression uh, that was made by King Ahaz himself with what would have been his signet ring. Right, So pressed into clay, similar to how you might put a seal into wax, was this phrase, belonging to Ahaz, son of Yehotam, uh, that's a variation of the spelling Jotham, king of Judah. And this clay impression was recently discovered, 1995, so so pretty recently, uh, in a private collection of a guy who collects these things, I think it's in Britain is where this one was found, right? But it dates back precisely to the 8th century B.C. when Scripture tells us that Ahaz was a king in Judah. Here's another example. 
uh, that orange thing in the middle is actually made out of a precious uh, stone called carnelian. And it's shaped in the form of a scarab. So if you've ever seen the mummy movies, right, or know ancient Egypt, they love those beetles, right? That's the basic shape. And in hieroglyphics on it is this phrase, belonging to Usha, servant of Ahaz. These are just two examples. I could show you more, but it would take too much time. But they tell us that this was very much a, a real person. It's uh, clear in the archaeological record. And here's how he is described in Scripture. Jumping over to 2 Kings chapter 16. Ahaz, the son of Jotham, began to rule over Judah in the 17th year of King Pekah's reign in Israel. Again, the tribes of the nation of Israel had been split into two, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Uh, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. So while he's in his 20s and his 30s, he's responsible for leading the nation of Judah primarily in and around the city of Jerusalem. But notice this. He did not do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord his God as his ancestor David had done. If you've ever read throughout the books of like Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, after each king of Israel to the north and Judah to the south, there's some sort of summary statement like this. Either they walked in the way of David and Solomon and the other kings who were faithful, or they did not. And here's what uh, it goes on to describe King Ahaz did. Instead, he followed the example of the kings of Israel, even sacrificing his own son in the fire. Uh, there was uh, a particular god in the Canaanite religious system called Molech, uh, and child sacrifice was essential to worshiping him. And so apparently King Ahaz participated in that with some of his own children. In this way, he followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven out of the land ahead of the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the pagan shrines and on the hills and of, under every green tree. So this gives us a little glimpse into the person uh, and the personality of King Ahaz, right? A very real historic individual attested in the archaeological record, but one who tragically fell away from worshiping God and God alone. So in Isaiah chapter 7, we see this king in Jerusalem as armies begin to surround the city. Here's what it says. The news had come to the royal court of Judah, Syria is allied with Israel against us. So the hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear like trees shaking in a storm. Isn't that an interesting picture, right? Maybe you've been in a storm where the winds are just blowing and everything is shifting and moving. Uh, it's a very real depiction of them shaking in their boots, you might also say, because they knew who was gathering in force around them. Here's why. Jumping over to Second Chronicles, which also describes this moment in history. Because of all this, all of Ahaz's false worship, the Lord his God allowed the king of Syria to defeat Ahaz and to exile large numbers of his people to Damascus. The armies of the king of Israel, remember they're allied together against Judah to the south, uh, had defeated Ahaz and inflicted many casualties on his army. In a single day, Pekah, son of Remaliah, Israel's king, killed 120,000 of his Judah's troops. All of them experienced warriors because they had abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So just prior to the events in Isaiah chapter 7, Israel had suffered, or Judah rather, had suffered a terrible loss in battle to their neighbors to the north of the nation of Israel, right? And as many as 120,000 of their bravest, most well-trained warriors had died in a single day, right? A colossal loss to the nation of Judah. But it gets worse from there. For we're told that Zikri, a warrior from Ephraim, killed Maasiah, the king's son. So apparently one of the ones he had not sacrificed to Molech, had died in battle. As well as Azrikam, the king's palace commander, and Elkanah, the king's second in command. So like the generals in his army, they were gone too. The armies of Israel captured 200,000 women and children from Judah and seized the tremendous amounts of plunder which they took with them back to Samaria. So not only had Syria defeated them in battle and taken people to exile up further north to Damascus, but their neighbors to the north, Right? Their extended cousins, you might say, had also humiliated them in war and taken off hundreds of thousands of people uh, into, uh, 
into their own lands. So there's good reason that Ahaz and the others are afraid in that moment. But it's in that precise uh, moment where they had experienced tremendous loss and the armies of their enemies were encamping around them that God sends to them the prophet Isaiah. And here's what Isaiah was sent to tell them. This invasion, the one that has you shaking in your boots, it'll never happen. It'll never take place. And then he goes on to describe how the nation of Syria, the the allied nation further north, how that would soon fall. And then in verse 8, Israel itself, the neighbors to the north, in 65 years, they would also be wiped off of the face of the earth. And in fact, if we go back in the Bible and in history, that's exactly what happened. And in the midst of this, uh, Ahaz is called, in spite of his tarnished history and all of the mistakes he has made to put his trust in God, and he says, unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. So Ahaz, you might even say one of the worst of the worst, is given another chance to put his trust in God. And when faced with an insurmountable army that had already humiliated and defeated him in battle, God says, tell you what, you can still put your trust in me, and I alone am the one who can deliver you. But here's the problem. King Ahaz had already made up his mind about what he wanted to do. Back in 2 Chronicles, he had already made an alliance with the king of Assyria, uh, Tiglath-Pileser III, well known in the ancient record as one of the most horrific kings who together with his armies would lay waste and utterly devastate any land that they conquered. It was so bad that they would go into places and where there were pregnant women, they would publicly disembowel them. And those captives that survived the warfare, they would put fish hooks in their nose and lead them off uh, into exile, right? Graphic, hostile, uh, inhumane. Interestingly, the capital city of Assyria, uh, here's a map to show you kind of the lands that they controlled, was Nineveh. Do you remember the prophet Jonah, right, who was told to go and proclaim the word of the Lord to the people of Nineveh? You want to know why he ran the other way? (laughs) These were bad guys, okay? But Ahaz, thinking that his only option was to ally himself with the world's uh, most fearsome superpower at the time, thought that he could put his hope in human armies rather than in God himself. Uh, The green portion in the middle, stretching all the way down to Judah, you can see there, Jerusalem, up Israel to Syria, uh, over towards where later Babylon would rise to power. That was the land controlled by this Tilgath Pileser III. But as we saw in our text just a moment ago, he was not to be trusted. And although Ahaz has allied himself with him, when he finally showed up, he actually laid waste uh, to the people of God rather than defending them, right? But Second Chronicles says this, even during this time of trouble, King Ahaz continued to reject the Lord. He offered sacrifices to the God of Damascus, that's Syria to the north, who had defeated him, for he said, since these gods helped the kings of Aram, Maybe they'll help me too if I sacrifice to them. But instead, they led to his ruin and the ruin of Judah. So poor Ahaz uh, had given himself over to every desperate measure to try to maintain his control and try to help uh, lead his people out of what seemed like inescapable doom to the point that he would offer sacrifices to any god or anything out there. In fact, going so far as to build altars to all these other gods, including one within the temple of God itself in the city of Jerusalem. He took the altar that, uh, that had been made uh, before by Solomon, and he moved it to the side, and he put this other one in its place. Now, what Scripture tells us, and, and antiquity shows us too, uh, those altars were eventually destroyed by his son, Hezekiah, who led a bit of a revival after the time of Ahaz, including this stone, which was one par- what's part of one of those altars. Interestingly, uh, in order to demonstrate they weren't going to worship that God again, they turned it into a public outhouse, right, uh, to kind of show that they weren't going to worship this false God anymore. And so that's available in, uh, in Israel right now in one of their museums. So kind of just a random bit of history. I told you I was going to geek out on this a little bit. I thought it was interesting, okay? So back then to Isaiah chapter 7. We have King Ahaz, one of the worst of the worst, sold out to worshiping false gods, 
uh, already having committed himself to an alliance with the greatest superpower of the world at that time, hoping that that would be his deliverance. It's into that very moment that God says Isaiah and says, if you put your trust in me, the thing you fear the most won't happen. But he goes even further. Later, the Lord sent this message to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation. Remember Gideon, the fleece? Put out the fleece, and if it's dry, then I know that you're true, or if it's wet and everything else is dry. So God's saying, hey, come on, test me in this and see if I'm not uh, the God who I claim to be. Make it as difficult as you want, as high as heaven or as deep as the place of the dead. But, verse 12, Ahaz, in a false form of piety, says, no, I will not test the Lord like that. So it's in that moment then that we get this prophecy of Emmanuel. Isaiah says, listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now this Emmanuel child was almost certainly one that was born within Ahaz's own family. Perhaps he had a wife or a concubine that had not yet had a child. The word here, virgin, could be young maiden, or it could be someone who uh, was technically still a virgin. In either case, what we're told, by the time this child is old enough to choose right and reject what is wrong, he'll be eating yogurt and honey. So young child. And behold, before the child is that old, the lands of the two kings you fear so much will be deserted. So to this king who had set himself against God repeatedly, God nonetheless shows up and in an act of mercy says, even now I'll give you a sign that I am God. Uh, your wife will have a child. This child will be called Emmanuel. And within his own childhood, you'll see the enemies that you fear the most actually laid waste. So what are we supposed to learn from this? Why would God reveal himself as Emmanuel, God with us, when it seemed like Israel or Judah were at their lowest of lows, fighting against each other, about to go to war, allying themselves with the worst of humankind? Here's what I think is interesting. Um, whether we're kings or not, we often face odds that seem insurmountable. We're faced with a health issue, a family challenge, a job issue, something in our school that is outside of our control. And when we look at the forces outside of us, we feel overwhelmed. We feel outgunned, outmanned. In the midst of those moments, just like this historical context, God says, remember who I am. And remember, I'm right there with you. I am Emmanuel, God with us. And if we look back at the whole of human history, what we see is that God's dream and his ultimate desire from the very beginning was to live with us. Why did God create the world in the first place? Why did he create this planet and fill it with humans? It was so that he could walk with us. He could talk with us. He could share life with us. But God also knows there is this sin condition that leads Ahaz to do the terrible things he does, but also breaks us on the inside as well. And God knows that that sin condition separates from us from him. So he's been at work ever since to try to repair the broken relationship we have with him and the broken relationships that scatter our lives as well. So as people who know this God, Emmanuel, this desire that God has to dwell and live with us, what are we to do, especially when we are facing uncertain times or insurmountable odds? To answer that, I want to take you to another section of Scripture, Psalm 46. Uh, this weekend, um, we're remembering uh, Martin Luther and the Reformation. We sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Our organ was rededicated this Sunday in our sanctuary. It was fantastic. Uh, when he wrote that hymn, A Mighty Fortress, he was inspired by these very words from Psalm 46. And although they don't use the name Emmanuel, you'll see in a moment they use the root word behind it, God with us. So let's see what it says. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. If only Ahaz had remembered that when he was surrounded by the enemy armies. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. 
That's the name we saw earlier, El Elyon. Right, Because God dwelled in the midst of Jerusalem. In fact, he said, at that very temple in the Holy of Holies, I will come down from heaven and I will dwell with you so that you will know that I am your God and you are my people. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. So why did Ahaz fear the invading armies? If he had put his trust in God, he promised uh, nothing would overtake them. Verse 6. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies, by the way, that's Yahweh Tsebaot, we looked at a few weeks ago, is here among us. You can see in Hebrew there, Imanu. God is with us, especially in the hard times when it seems like the odds are against us and whatever we're facing is overwhelming. The God of Israel is our fortress. See, here's the beautiful thing. This Emmanuel, this God with us, he was so interested in breaking down the barriers between us and him and one with another that he entered into the broken mess of this world. Right? That's why Matthew says, in this very moment when Christ took on human flesh, God was fulfilling ultimately what he had promised to Ahaz and to Israel and Judah back in the day. That God would enter into this mess of the world and although he was perfect in and of himself, He never deviated to the right or the left from God's best. Nonetheless, he willingly entered into the mess of our lives, the brokenness of sin. He took it upon himself so that he might break its power over us. What does Emmanuel mean? It means that God stands with us in the hardest of times when we've made the worst mistakes and still says, I'm not going to let that come between us. If you confess your sin, I am faithful and just. I'll forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There is nothing you can say or do that'll take you further from God than he can come and rescue you. So then to close, one last passage here from Psalm 46. Would you guys read this with me? Verses 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. As people of Emmanuel, what can we know for sure? God will never leave us or forsake us. He will meet us in our lowest lows. He will carry us through, no matter what the odds may seem. He is Emmanuel, God with us. As you reflect on that, we have a couple questions before we send you off with a blessing here in a few minutes. We'd like to take some time uh, and give you a chance to reflect on these two. If you're with someone, lean over and share what's stirring in your heart right now, something that makes you feel discouraged, abandoned, hard-pressed, or overwhelmed. And then secondly, how does it help to know, regardless of your circumstances, that God is with you? And if you want to take a screenshot of this, I put in a couple more passages. If you want to go deeper into a few passages that talk about what it means to have God with us, you can see there from Genesis and John, those are resources to you. But we'll take two, three minutes. We'll let you reflect on that before we close with a sending and a blessing. So lean over. If someone's with you, share what comes to mind, and I'll bring us back at 1210.